Dr. Condoleezza Rice is a former US National Security Advisor and Secretary of State and the current director of the Hoover Institution. She's also a scratch golfer, history professor, concert pianist, and the newly minted co-owner of the Denver Broncos American football team. Condi, where do you get your sense of the past from? Um, at the, who taught you history? At the University of Denver, your father taught a course on the history of Africa uh, to 1800. Was it him? My father was clearly the person who uh, stimulated my interest in history. Uh, he himself uh, actually did his degree in theology, but he was always very interested in history. Um, he could always tell these great tales uh, about history, about the history of the United States, about the history of the world. And so I would really credit him with my keen sense that uh, the past mattered. I will have to give my mother just a little bit uh, here though, because she was a musician. And uh, very early on, she bought a little book for me called Lives of the Great Composers. And so that part of the past, uh, the history of Mozart's life, the history of Schubert's life, um, I would attribute to my, to my mother. You were still a teenager when you won the Colorado State Championship for Ancient Greek and Roman History. In one of the early podcasts in this series, Victor Davis Hanson argued that some of the historical and political lessons that Greece and Rome taught us are still valid today. Thucydides famously said that his history of the Peloponnesian Wars was written for all time. Do you agree with that approach or, or do we study ancient history more for the stories than the morals? Oh, I think we study ancient history because it has quite a lot to say about uh, modern day human beings. Uh, the sad thing is in some ways human beings haven't changed that much. Um, and when I studied um, Greek and Roman history, which I still love, by the way, and uh, I do have to, just a disclosure, I think the championship was only held among parochial schools. So it's not as if I defeated the entire uh, state of Colorado, but um, <laughs> I had, uh, had taken Latin. And so um, I loved the study of Latin, loved the language. But um, I think what um, all of these great civilizations really teach is something that I wish we could teach in our colleges today. I would have every student study a great civilization that rose and fell because it will teach you about hubris. And um, I think that, uh, unfortunately, human beings are still given uh, in major ways to hubris, particularly when they become successful. And so I think that's what I really, I loved about the study of, of Greek and Roman history, um, the imperfections of them, the tremendous civilizations that they built, and then the fact that they could never keep them uh, stable for very long. You yourself were brought face to face with the dark side of American history at a young age when on the 15th of September 1963, aged only eight, you heard the bomb go off that killed four young black girls on their way to the Sunday school in your hometown of Birmingham, Alabama, in one of the worst moments of the civil rights struggle. Your 2010 book about what you call your extraordinary ordinary family records that terrible moment and its effect on the black community. When did you first realize that things were happening in the civil rights struggle that would be studied in history, that you were literally living history? Well, going back again to my extraordinary ordinary parents, uh, they never missed an opportunity to point out that what we were going through would have historical uh, historical impact, uh, that it was really very important to mark that moment. And so um, during the great civil rights movement, 62, 63, in my hometown of Birmingham, um, I remember being driven over to see Kelly Ingram Park. Now that was the park where Bull Connor's police dogs uh, famously uh, took on peaceful um, black demonstrators with uh, water hoses and, and uh, really quite violent. Um, and I can remember being driven down there uh, a good distance away because my parents wanted us to be safe, but saying, look at what is happening here. This will be remembered. And uh, when the young girls, uh, the four young girls were killed in the uh, 16th Street Baptist Church, it was not just uh, for us a matter of history, of course. It was a very personal thing because uh, Denise McNair, one of the young girls had been in my father's uh, kindergarten at his church. I have a picture of my father handing Denise her kindergarten graduation certificate. 
uh, the parents were known to us. The McNairs were a part of the community. And so it was this odd um, sense of living history, knowing that this was going to matter for all time. But also it was very personal because we lived in that community. We knew those people. Um, I think my parents always felt it could have been me. And then two months uh, afterwards, after that bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church, you were in Mrs. Riles's geography class, uh, about to take her history class after recess, when you heard that President Kennedy had been assassinated. Tell us about that moment and the primary emotions that you felt. Well, uh, we heard that the president had been shot uh, in Mrs. Ryle's uh, geography class. And then there was a recess, and then we would come back for history. And by the time we came back for history, um, I heard Mrs. Riles, uh, who was standing at the classroom door, say to another teacher, the president is dead. The president is dead, and there's a southerner in the White House, she said. What is going to become of us now? Because there was such great hope that the Kennedys would uh, take that moment of 16th Street Baptist Church and push forward the historical, uh, the historic uh, civil rights legislation, and with a quote Southerner in the White House, Lyndon Baines Johnson, a great fear that everything would roll back. Um, but it shows how history can be um, sometimes a bit surprising, because of course that's not what happened. Lyndon Baines Johnson became the the president who would deliver both the Civil Rights uh, Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But I think nobody would have thought it at that day. And as a little fourth grader, I just remember uh, being a bit terrified myself that uh, there wasn't going to be any progress. And you were 13 in 1968, and you described that extraordinary year as the moment of your political awakening. Tell us about your reactions to the assassination of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy um, and to the Tet Offensive and the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia and the long-term effects it had on you and your worldview. Well, that year of 1968, somebody called it a crack in time. And I've always thought that that was really apt uh, because uh, with all that we've gone through with the civil rights movement, things were starting to settle in. Uh, life was starting to feel normal in 65 and 66 and 67. Uh, my parents and I had moved to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where my dad was now dean of students at Stillman College, historically black college in Tuscaloosa. And uh, then uh, in, on that April day when uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated and then uh, just a couple of months later after the Los Angeles uh, Democratic primary um, vote in June, uh, it felt as if things were coming apart and they continued to feel as if they were coming apart. There was, of course, the violence at the Democratic National Convention that summer uh, with uh, Abraham Rubikoff, I'll never forget uh, saying, you know, those are our children uh, to to Mayor Daley. And of course, on and on, the Tet Offensive and uh, the and of course, in France, we were having the, the riots. And so, again, because my father in particular always wanted me to remember those moments and understand them and uh, that something had happened in Vietnam that was going to change the course of history. We watched the news every night. We talked about these issues every night. Uh, it was a little bit hard to avoid what was going on because my father was determined that we would, we would know it. Um, it probably did shape my worldview, but there was a little bit of an interlude. You know, I, I went to college to be a concert pianist <laughs> and not to study uh, the great great moments in history. But I remember very well, Andrew, that I was sitting in the music uh, lounge with some other music students on the day that the United States uh, had the, the um, incursion into Cambodia. And um, my, uh, in, in the 72, and my um, classmate stand, sitting there said, well, what's that all about? I don't understand. It's about some place called Vietnam. And I thought, oh my goodness, I may be in the wrong major here. The people in this room have never heard of Vietnam. Uh, well, speaking about Vietnam, when you became the 19th National Security Advisor in 2001, who were the predecessors in that post who you most admired and wanted to learn from? And were there any who you thought might give you an historical lesson about what to avoid? Just to let you know, H.R. McMaster uh, put you and Henry Kissinger in the first uh, category and some of the Vietnam era national security advisors in the second. Well, certainly in that first category of people that I admired and, and helped to live from, to learn from Henry Kissinger, of course, uh, because in many ways, Henry Kissinger had my background. He was an academic. 
Uh, later on, he would become, of course, both National Security Advisor and Secretary of State. Nobody's tried that since, uh, being of combining the two positions. But uh, Henry uh, was uh, such a, a great figure. Uh, but probably the most influential for me was Brent Scowcroft. Um, I had been on Brent Scowcroft's national security team uh, as the Soviet specialist at the end of the Cold War. And he was a low-key personality, never put himself in the story, uh, was always uh, the person who was working to make sure that the president was well supported. Um, and I just admired that quiet way that he went about it. I'll leave aside the ones who um, I think <laughs> you're, not, you're not going to go into McGeorge I, Bundy not, or I'm any not, of those I'm ones. Not. I, I will Fair tell enough. you, having, having been National Security Advisor, maybe I'm just a little bit more tolerant <laughs> of what it's like to be in that uh, that role and make those mistakes. And then you went on to become Secretary of State in 2005, and you were the highest ranking woman in the history of the United States to be in the presidential line of succession as close as fourth in line. As National Security Advisor, you and your predecessor, Colin Powell, had already been the highest ranking uh, blacks, a term you prefer to African American in the executive branch. So on top of your responsibilities guiding the president on national security, how heavily did these glass ceiling breaking factors weigh on you in both the areas of gender and race? I've always thought that people who become first didn't set out to be first. <laughs> and if you spend too much time thinking about the fact that you're the first, you're not going to actually do the job. One of my very good friends was the, the late Sally Ride, the first woman in space. And Sally said to me once, I didn't intend to be the first woman in space. I just wanted to be in space. And I, I kind of felt that way about, about uh, my role, both at the National Security Council and then as Secretary of State. But then there was a moment when I was sitting with uh, the president uh, on one side of him as National Security Advisor, and Colin Powell was on the other side as Secretary of State, and Tony Blair was sitting across from us. And he looked at us, this black man uh, as Secretary of State, this black woman as National Security Advisor, and he said, I have to wonder, could this happen in Britain? And he said, not yet. And at that moment, it occurred to me that with all of its troubled history uh, on race and slavery and our birth defect, that this moment for the United States of America, that in some ways, I guess you could say, the two most critical national security uh, players supporting the president at this extraordinary time of 9-11 and the wars, they were both black. And you had to say, that's it, something quite remarkable about the United States of America. Certainly, certainly. Uh, there is a chance that the um, next prime minister is going to be Indian in, in Britain. Yes, um, yes. That's a, that's a, a, a chance anyhow. Um, now, your, your description of slavery as America's birth defect, um, which is a brilliant description. Your great-grandmother, Julia Reed, was a freed former house slave. No fewer than 42 of the 56 signatories of the Declaration of Independence own slaves at some stage in their careers. So how do you feel about the 1619 Project, which it seems to view the entirety of American history through the prism of, of slavery and race relations? Well, I would say that uh, slavery and race relations shaped a lot of America, of course, uh, when one thinks about how the United States finally got built. It was because uh, they made a compromise that uh, allowed three-fifths of a man for the counting of slaves. So it, it was there. But I just have to think that to see that as the entire prism through which to see American uh, history, American uh, revolutionary history, American colonial history is just uh, patently wrong and ahistorical. Uh, one can say that we had a birth defect. One can say that slavery played a major role in the way that the United States evolved. Uh, but one would then also have to tell the story of John Adams, uh, who actually, as a lawyer, defended the Amistad <laughs> Um, rebellious, uh, uh, the, the slaves. And so one would have to tell the story about the tensions uh, that so many had, that uh, the tensions that so many felt. And one would have to tell the story of how that remarkable constitution of the United States of America was eventually the vehicle that not only uh, in, enshrined the freeing of the slaves, but also uh, was the constitution that led to the descendants of slaves finally getting their rights. So uh, it's a complex history, and the 1619 Project isn't complex in its telling of it. 
we have a, a, a fairly warm feeling about John Adams uh, as well in Britain, but partly because he defended the Boston Massacre um, British soldiers, but much more because he was the first ambassador to the court of St. James and uh, and got on well with uh, George III, which I, shows, I think shows a great deal of graciousness <laughs> in, in both people, don't you? Well, I'm very much looking forward to my summer reading of uh, the, the Last American <laughs> King. Well, we might have to uh, uh, edit that out of the <laughs> recording, but thank you very much indeed. Um, it's it's long struck me that it history is likely to be far kinder to the George W. Bush administration than current affairs have been, where the narrative has been overly influenced by left-wing media outlets and anti-war groups and a hostile academia, including historians. As the official papers become available to historians and we're able to see the events of 2001 to 9 in their proper historical perspective, how do you think that administration will be viewed in the future? Well, I believe that when um, when historians get the full story, they will first of all see uh, that the caricature of uh, George W. Bush is somehow a cowboy who wanted to take America to war uh, no matter what, uh, that he was callous somehow in thinking about uh, the challenges that would emerge uh, in Iraq, that he didn't take the time to understand uh, the Middle East or Afghanistan, uh, I think it will show a very different picture of someone who, after the horrors of 9-11, I mean, imagine that you're eight months into your presidency and all of a sudden you have the biggest attack on American soil really in our history. If one discounts that nasty affair with the British uh, during the war. <laughs> Which uh, I think you uh, should. Yes, during the War of 1812. <laughs> but to be that president and to see the Twin Towers come down and then the hole in the Pentagon, and I was with him every moment as we walked around in that Pentagon and we saw this attack on America, uh, of course you were going to take some actions that were very tough. Uh, you were going to take some actions that in retrospect some would say were extreme. But um, I think it will, the history will show a president whose greatest fear was that he would be the president who let it happen twice. And that would have been inexcusable as president of the United States. And do you think history has that capacity to be more objective as time goes on? Do you think that because the, the sheer passage of time allows historians to, to see in the, in the round things that perhaps academic historians today aren't able to? I certainly hope that um, historians maintain that capacity. If I look back on the great histories from which I learned, um, I think it's very obvious that uh, probably the first really great history that I read was Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August. Mm -hmm. And uh, that perspective on what was going on there in, in a way that was not accusatory of any of the parties and that tried to understand the, the puts and the takes, the ups and the downs that they were all facing, I would hope that there would be historians who can do, still do that about modern history. But I have to say I'm sometimes concerned uh, that history has become uh, so much uh, a lens uh, of the historian rather than an effort to try to get the lens on uh, those who were making the history. And, of course, Barbara Tuckman's book came out some 65 years yes. after. I mean, yes. do you think it might take 65 years for people to be able to view the Bush administration in, in the round? It might well take that long uh, because um, we're still living so much with, uh, with the implications. But then on the other hand, as a university professor, I'm, I'm fully aware how fast time fa flies. Mm. Um, I remember one day that a young woman was giving, a, a, giving her report on uh, the Cold War, and she kept saying uh, Brezhnev, Brezhnev. And I thought, how could she not know that it's Brezhnev? And I thought, she's probably never heard his name. She, of course, wasn't born when the Cold War uh, was ended. So uh, maybe the time will go a little bit more quickly. But even if it takes uh, 65 years, 70 years, 100 years, um, I just hope that uh, the history will reflect uh, the real dilemmas and challenges of those times. And that, the, the, the idea of context, uh, brings me on to my next question about um, the pulling down of the Confederate statues in the South, which in 2017 you said, if you forget your history, you're likely to repeat it. When you start wiping out your history, sanitizing your history to make you feel better, it's a bad thing. 
Recently, we've seen Thomas Jefferson uh, removed from New York City Hall and Teddy Roosevelt from the Natural History Museum um, on Central Park West. Where do you think we are in the culture wars today? And do you see a way that they can be resolved amicably? Well, I when I see uh, these incidents with uh, Jefferson or Roosevelt, let me let me just say on the Confederates, um, I understand uh, why we should not name military bases after Confederate generals. They were traitors to the country. Why would we do that? And losers and, as and well. Lo- and they <laughs> lost on top of it. They lost. Yeah. Uh, but even some of the statues, you know, I said I, I would like the seven-year-old to be able to say to his mother, Mommy, who was that Stonewall Jackson man? And for the mother to be able to explain. Because uh, I do come from the study of a, uh, a culture and a history and a society uh, that used to airbrush people out of uh, photographs. Um, and mm-hmm. then you do lose the sense of your history. But then when I see it for people like Jefferson or, or those who at one point wanted to not name a, 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 a school after Abraham Lincoln, of all people, I think um, how incredibly callous of us. And uh, talk about hubris. Who are we to judge in that way? These were human beings. They were in many ways flawed human, flawed human beings. But can anybody uh, say that uh, Jefferson uh, didn't have an enormous impact on where we are now and in a positive way? And also, doesn't it open up the probability that our statues are going to be pulled down for something that we uh, consider we, we know is, is uh, wrong today, but we aren't able to do that much about? Well, that's the, that's the point of the hubris, uh, yes. to think that somehow we in this age have all of the answers and they were so wrong that we should dishonor them now. As to whether or not the culture wars can, uh, we can find a bridging, I, I do think that there are those who are beginning to think that this has become too extreme. Um, I have a lot of friends uh, in the university whose politics would be quite left, but they find uh, some of the chilling of the academic environment to be truly troubling. Uh, They find uh, that those who don't want to understand the history but simply want to, uh, to criticize or cancel those who were a part of that history troubling. And so maybe there's a broader um, support for for trying to uh, to honor our history, understand our history, be cold eyed and clear eyed about what it was, uh, but not to not to engage in this uh, this almost silliness of uh, they were so bad and we are so righteous. Actually, in, in England, what we found recently is that asking the local people is a good thing to do. When when the local people in Watford and Lambeth have been asked what they want, they tend to want to keep the same street names they've grown up with and the street furniture and the statues that they're that they're used to. They've, lots of them are very happy to have plaques nearby explaining the the full history and the negative side but they don't want to just sort of eviscerate it and i i really believe that's the right answer um you know we've had some controversy here at stanford university because the first president david star jordan uh, was unfortunately uh, something of a eugenicist and so uh, we've renamed things and pulled statues down and and i think you know you could explain that history Uh, still admire the things that he accomplished. But it goes back to this notion that uh, human beings are not perfect. Uh, My grandmother, who was a quite religious woman, used to say, the only human being who's perfect was Jesus Christ, and that's because he was God. (laughs) If we could think in that way sometimes uh, and be a little bit uh, more forgiving of those who lived uh, years before, uh, I think... I would like to hope that we could be treated that way 100 years from now. Now, I'm going to bring you on to somebody who I don't think you're going to be forgiving of uh, terribly much as a Russia expert. What do you make of Vladimir Putin's (sighs) historical sense of Russia and its destiny? His decision to invade Ukraine seems to have been, at least in part, impelled by a sense of what he called the historical unity of the Ukrainian and Russian peoples in a 6,500 word essay of that name that he published in July last year. It seems a very strange document when I read it. What did you make of it? Um, first as a work of history, and secondly as an indication of intent. Well, it is this deluded sense of of history, of course, and uh, this effort 
to uh, to liquidate uh, the Ukrainians as a separate people, their language, their history. Um, it it is a sad a, a sad fact that for a lot of its history, Ukraine was not independent. It belonged to a lot of empires during its time, but. These are people who kept their distinct culture, their, their language. I speak very good Russian. I can make mistakes if I try to understand Ukrainian because they are not the same language. And so Vladimir Putin uh, has this conceit, and he, he told me, uh, he told President Bush and me, you know, Ukraine is a made-up country, he said. Uh, it isn't a real country. And so that deluded sense has led him to believe uh, that Russia will only be great when it reestablishes the Russian Empire. And there can be no Russian Empire if there is an independent Ukraine. I think we have a hard time in the 21st century understanding what is going on right now, because it's a way of thinking that we assign to the past. But it's very much the way that Vladimir Putin thinks about uh, modern day Ukraine. And by the way, it led him to make a terrible mistake, which was to believe that the Ukrainians would welcome their Russian brethren, um, and it led him to send his army to capture Kyiv with five days provisions and their dress uniforms for the parade. So uh, that kind of misreading of history has had quite a uh, quite a cost for Russia as well. But I have no doubt that this is about the reestablishment of the Russian Empire. He told me once, uh, Andrew, that Russia was only great when it was ruled by great men like Peter the Great and Alexander the Second. And you know, now he fashions himself as something of Peter the Great. And um, that delusion is a uh, is obviously a, a great one and did lead to this uh, terrible miscalculation. But do you think now that he's seen the Ukrainian people rise up in their virtual entirety and and fight back, fight back with tremendous uh, courage, needless to say, in the leadership of um, President Zelensky, that he might have had second thoughts about uh, this? Or do you think, like most dictators, he just goes and bangs on thinking he was right all the time anyway? I think like most uh, dictators, he is not uh, susceptible to uh, arguments that are contrary to his own thinking. In that document, in that uh, that essay that he wrote, he referred to Lithuania no fewer than 17 times. Do you think if Putin were allowed to win in Ukraine, um, or indeed uh, um, go back to the status quo ante, or in any way not be punished for um, the attack on Ukraine, that parts of NATO might be in danger, or does he recognize that the Collective Defense Article 5 of the NATO Treaty makes countries like Lithuania safe from what uh, President Biden called incursion? Well, I would like to think, at least, that he is not suicidal and uh, that he doesn't want to test the American president on Article 5. An attack upon one is an attack upon all. Uh, let's remember that we have actually never, as the United States, simply depended on the words of the president. That's why we had a tripwire of American forces in Germany for 45 years. Because the view was, uh, if you are going to, uh, to do this, uh, Soviet general staff, Russian general staff, you'll have to kill an American. Now, do you really want to do that and present the president of the United States as a choice to how he responds? And so I believe we've done a very fine job of uh, limiting the choices that Putin has. Um, I'm very pleased uh, that Finland and Sweden uh, have decided to finally join NATO. It's, it's a, a friend of mine said that Putin has managed to end uh, German pacifism and Swedish neutrality all within a matter of months. And uh, it, it does seem that he's done exactly that. Um, if if I have, uh, I have several regrets, but one is, you know, Ukraine was a vacuum uh, because uh, NATO and Article 5 protected everything around it, but not Ukraine. And uh, perhaps that's something that, um, that we'll all look back and think, could we have gotten even closer to Ukraine? How closely are the Chinese watching this, would you say? We've seen, uh, obviously, uh, some saber-rattling in recent days uh, from China over Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. Are they, uh, do you think what happens in Ukraine has an effect on what President Xi is thinking over Taiwan? I'm quite certain that uh, she is watching uh, what is happening in Ukraine. Uh, it would have to, at this point, I think, be something of a salutary le uh, lesson, however, because on, on the one hand, not only uh, is the Russian army not performing terribly well, and he must wonder how really good his armed forces would be under these circumstances, having, by the way, not really fought wars 
uh, in any recent time, and the one that they did, the so-called Vietnam incursion that didn't turn out so well. Uh, so there's that. There's also the tremendous sanctions that have been imposed on, on Russia. But again, you know, getting inside the mind of an authoritarian, I think, is extremely difficult because uh, they are authoritarians because they insulate themselves from contradictory thoughts. And so uh, we have to be prepared for the fact that he's thinking, oh, I'll just do it better. You're on record as saying that history has an essential part to play in what you want Hoover to achieve. Uh, would you like to elaborate on that? I am a, a great believer uh, that uh, not only can you uh, repeat history if you don't know it, you know, the old, the old, uh, the old notion about being uh, condemned to repeat it, but history is such a rich way to understand the human condition and to understand uh, the achievements of human beings, the frailties of human beings. Uh, as I've said, the hubris uh, that leads civilizations to rise and fall. Uh, and what I loved about it uh, was that, as a student, was that it opened up this world to me of the past. And I loved for a moment trying to live in the shoes of those people. Now, it also was a history that I'll call big history. It was the grand sweep of history. It was the people who, by their decisions, moved history. And we've moved away from that in the study of history in the modern academy. Uh, there's some very fine historians. The, the stories that they tell, the work that they do is getting narrower and narrower. By the way, it's happening in my own discipline of political science as well, because big issues are hard to get your arms around. And so I hope that here at Hoover, uh, in part because it is in our DNA. We are a library and archive. Uh, we were a library and archive first. And uh, it was in large part because uh, people wanted a place to, to store and maintain and nurture and protect uh, the history that was being driven out of Russia at the time of the revolution. And so it's in our DNA to do this. And um, we have very fine historians like Neil Ferguson and uh, Victor Davis Hanson. Uh, we've just been fortunate to bring Steve Kotkin uh, along. We have a lot of historians who visit, uh, as you know, Andrew. And I hope that we will be a place where uh, that big history can be done, a place that mobilizes and uses that history to understand the policy challenges of the current um, the current times and most important uh, illuminates this this great thing called history for our students uh, so that they can uh, can revel in it a little bit and and maybe even read a book or two there are uh, two questions I always ask both of uh, all my uh, interviewees um, and and the first is what book are you reading at the moment obviously I'm hoping that you're going to come up with a history book or a biography <laughs> when I ask this you don't have to if, it, if it's a detective novel do say no. so but uh, <laughs> no. I'm rather expecting it not to be well I love biography and uh, I have been reading a, a lot of biography uh, lately um, I've gone back you know to read I like to go back and read and um, I have gone back to read uh, the my favorite biography of my favorite founding father is Alexander Hamilton. And so uh, I've been going back through the Chernow uh, book, in part because um, we're doing some work at Stanford on, uh, or at Hoover, on uh, some of the institutions of the United States. And we're starting a project called uh, a Center for the Revitalization of American Institutions. And I want to go back and understand what our founding fathers intended. So I'm going to read a lot of biographies of the founding fathers, and that's really fun. But I have to admit, I'm doing one thing that shows it's not really history. I'm reading a lot about AI these days. Oh, yeah, interesting. Uh, yes, the, interesting. Uh, a great book called The Master Algorithm, which is uh, really very, very interesting and in this regard. And, of course, regard. there was Henry Kissinger and, and Eric Schmidt's And Eric Schmidt's, work, which it? I've read that book, which is really uh, excellent. It is, but nerve-wracking. That last chapter yes, is a bit yes, it's a, <laughs> worrying, yes. isn't it? <laughs> Very, very worrying. <laughs> And my last question is, what's your favorite counterfactual, your, your what-if moment in history that you, uh, that you like to look back on or at least uh, wonder about? I, I've always had one, which is, uh, it's supposed Lenin hadn't made it onto that SEAL train oh, and yeah. gotten there to, to uh, at that moment. And, and a sort of similar counterfactual is, what if we had allowed uh, the Russian government uh, to, uh, to get out of the war? Uh, I, I think that the, 
I won't say that the Russian uh, Revolution was avoidable, uh, but oh my goodness, how life might have been different. Well, that brings us to the the great man and woman ver version of history versus uh, what T.S. Eliot called the vast impersonal forces. From your own career, from your own uh, life at the top in the decision-making processes of the most powerful country in the world, how do you come down on those uh, on that dichotomy or well, seeming dichotomy? I'll, I'll give you a bit of a Solomonic uh, answer, if I may. <laughs> uh, on, on the one hand, I do not believe that a great man or woman can uh, completely change these great impersonal forces. Um, if I think about uh, Gorbachev in 1954, we don't get the same uh, the same answer. But a great man or a great woman when those great impersonal forces are moving in a particular direction, can make a huge difference in how this comes out. And again, if I use Gorbachev, I look at somebody with now a Soviet Union that was weakening, he could have made other choices, but fortunately he made the choice, the choice to let it die. I'm very pleased that you chose that one about Lenin, owing to the fact that many years ago I wrote an essay where Lenin is assassinated as he steps off the train at the yes. Finland station yes. in 1917. So I'm going to send that to you. Yeah, please uh, I do. Think you, I think <laughs> yes. it might amuse you. Thank you. It was a great pleasure being with you. We recorded that interview in late July. Uh, but on the 30th of August, Mikhail Gorbachev died, and we thought it worthwhile to ask uh, Condoleezza Rice her, her views on him. Uh, we managed to catch her when she was on her car phone. The global eulogies to Mikhail Gorbachev have been extraordinarily fulsome, but some of them have implied that he deliberately wanted to extinguish uh, Soviet communism all along. Isn't it more historically accurate to say that Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher put him in a position whereby he had little real alternative? Well, I do not think that Gorbachev intended to extinguish communism. As a matter of fact, I think he was a true believer. Uh, much more of a true believer, by the way, than uh, those who had come before him, people like Brezhnev. He actually believed that uh, if you could uh, remove the, the lies and the propaganda, that was the idea of Glasnost, and you could uh, restructure the idea of Tire Historica, uh, you could really appeal to people for what was good about the Soviet Union. He once told me, I want the Soviet Union to be a normal country. And so in that sense, he really believed uh, that there was something to this experiment that was worth saving, worth reforming. Uh, sadly for him, it turned out that if you removed the lies and you uh, removed the coercion, uh, there really wasn't anything left. And uh, I think he, the, the reason that I think the eulogies to him are uh, appropriately uh, favorable is that even when he faced circumstances uh, that were difficult, he just kept going. And I personally do not believe that we would have ended the Cold War peacefully uh, without his courage. Um, Condi Rice, thank you very much indeed. Please join me on the next Secrets of Statecraft podcast for a bracing conversation with former National Security Advisor and current military historian at the Hoover Institution, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. This podcast is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society and improve the human condition. For more information about our work or to listen to more of our podcasts or watch our videos, please visit hoover.org.